The following is a presentation from Bethel Baptist Church and Pastor Al Fury.
here today. Our ensemble is going to come and sing. Before they do, let's thank the Lord for his goodness. Father, we are so thankful. We praise your holy name that you always, always win. What a wonderful comfort to know that we have a God that is on the throne. So, Father, help us this day to worship you, to lift up your holy name. And bless us today in the word of God. Help us, Lord, to absorb it and to apply it to our lives. Thank you for the wonderful number of children here today. Father, may they be attentive. May they hear the word of God. Bless our workers as they take them out and teach them the message of salvation. Father, may the spirit of God guide them. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. i 
sing the name of Jesus. We worship the name of Jesus. We bow before you. Let's sing this morning number 11. Hymn number 11, let's stand. I sing the mighty power of God. Hymn number 11 this morning. Listen as the choir sings, Almighty.
children at this time and so when you get out into the highway, hallway today we've broken up into two groups because you're much too big for one classroom and so grades four five and six you listen to your teachers out there Mrs. Fett and uh, Mr. Cody will be out there and so you go to one class and grades one two and three you'll be going to a separate class so let's stand this morning we'll dismiss with a word of prayer and as we dismiss we're going to sing again in Oh, okay, we're going to dismiss the teenagers as well. So you young people over here, you'll be dismissed as well, and you'll go to the teen class over in the gym, all right? So let's have a word of prayer. We'll be dismissed this morning, and then we're going to sing in Christ alone. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your love for us. And we thank you that you're almighty. Bless the children today. Help them to hear from the word of God. Help our teachers. Fill them with thy Holy Spirit. And Father, we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask you children to walk as you're dismissed, all right? We're going to sing In Christ Alone. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my hope, my strength, my song. It's all in song. It's all in ground.
glad that you're here this morning. You're glad you're saved. Amen. Amen. Isn't it wonderful to see all the children out to church today? And many of these come to our, I would guess probably all of these children come to our Master Clubs program on Thursday nights. And we had visitation yesterday morning, went out and visited. It's amazing what a little visitation will do and invite some folks. And a lot of the kids brought some of their parents today. And so we're glad that you're here and we welcome you here today. We're so thankful that you're here. And I know that you're going to stay after and have a hot dog with us. Isn't that terrible? We don't have a lot to offer but a hot dog. But that's what the kids like, and so we did that for them. But you are more than welcome to stay and have a hot dog with us. We'd love to have you, and appreciate you so much coming and taking your Sunday to be with us. And uh, we're going to have a great day in the house of the Lord. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Brother McPherson's going to come and lead us with a word of prayer. And uh, brother, you come. Is Karen Greeley here this morning? She's not. It's her birthday today. So I remember to wish her a happy birthday. Uh, <coughs> There is one announcement that I like to make. I talked to uh, uh, Jimmy Roberts and uh, for uh, the seniors, uh, cl- we usually start at 9.30 on Tuesdays and we have a lesson time, Brother Baker is teaching, but uh, this week we're gonna be starting at nine. <clears throat> we're gonna do some uh, <clears throat> gymnastics and- uh, Gymnastics. <laughs> yeah. Exercise. That's the reason I said that is because we're going to leave the bouncy castles in there for this, <laughs> just for a joke. No, I'm not serious. But we are going to do exercise. Um, uh, Joanne Norris is going to do some exercise from 9 till 9.30 if you'd like to get in, involved in that. Be in prayer for <clears throat> uh, Caitlin Foreman. Uh, her uh, tumors, Donna said, have, have shrunk, and they're, they're not positive, but... Uh, so that's good news, and uh, be in prayer for uh, uh, Tony and uh, Lori. Uh, their uh, uh, son and brother-in-law passed away. Uh, Lawrence Burkholder, uh, 72, and uh, with complications. But he's a saved man. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. 72 years and, and gone in, off into heaven. And maybe somebody here this morning will get saved. And maybe there's one here in the auditorium that doesn't know the Lord. Maybe there's some uh, in the junior church program that aren't saved, that might get saved this morning. I I wish that you would uh, be in prayer about that. I'd like to read to you uh, one verse that the Lord gave me this morning. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That goes for healing, and that goes also for salvation, that someone might be saved. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So let's be much in prayer for the day today that somebody might come to know the Lord as Savior. We're going to have a word of prayer. Uh, Gerald, would you open in a word of prayer, please? Oh, Heavenly Father, we do thank you time in your house today. We just thank you for the number of boys and girls and some of the parents that have come. We just pray, Lord, that as they listen to the word, the music that we sang this morning, that they'll be blessed by the word of God. So just continue to bless and direct our path here at Bethel Baptist Church. Help, help us to be faithful every time the doors are open and uh, activities go on in this church. Just bless each one here today and bless the offering that they be used for your Thank you, you may be seated.
sing about the greatness of our God, hymn number 22. Would you stand with me this morning as we sing this final hymn, number 22, How Great Thou Art. Thank you. 
your Bibles this morning, please turn to Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 3. I'm thankful today and appreciate the music and the worship, not just worship. I hope the Lord is pleased when we sing about Him and His power and His name, but it also encourages my heart, helps me, and we come to exhort and encourage and edify, and I hope that you are encouraged. Boy, nothing ever can, nothing ever will overcome the Lord our God. I, I'm just thankful that we're on the right side, amen, that we're on the right side with God. And if you're not on the right side with God, you don't understand that power and that provision that God has for you today. And I hope that today, and is my prayer, that you'll be saved today. I'm thankful for these children that have come, and, and uh, from what we understand, we haven't got a final count yet, but over 130 on the buses this morning. We praise the Lord for that, and now they're going to hear the gospel message, and and some that invited parents to come. We appreciate them and I'm glad that you're here. And so I hope that you'll listen today. We're, we're talking about revival this month and revived uh, through rejoicing is our theme for the month of January. Every month we have a different theme for revived, but today is revived by the power of his name. And in Acts chapter 3, I, I want you to know it's a twofold message this morning. And if, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you need to be revived. Now, when I say revive there, that means to have life breathed into you. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. And the Bible word quickened there means to breathe life into or bring back to life or to revive. And so part of the message is for you. And I hope that you'll listen as we find how we can be revived through Jesus Christ. The Bible says, There is none other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but through Him. And so we have the wonderful promise of God, and if you're a child of God today, there's times we need revival as well. And revival can be defined in a lot of different ways, and I've, I've heard different people say it different ways. Oh, well, revival, true revival is when this happens or when that happens. I, I, I'm starting to understand a little better more and more that revival can take a lot of shapes and forms. And that God can revive your life and do a work in your life that's different than he does in somebody else's life. But here's what I know about revival. In every case, it's always the work of God. It's always the work of God. 
That might manifest itself differently in your life. You might have a different need and, and a drunkard might be revived to, to get away from the, from the bottle and, and somebody else might be revived to, to, to be spiritually renewed and rededicate their lives to Christ. And so it, it may take form in different ways, but it's when the Word of God grips us and the power of God works in us, that's revival. And I hope today that you'll get the revival that you need. That God would speak to your heart and move in your heart today. So let's look in Acts chapter 3 this morning. We notice, first of all, a story that reveals. A story that reveals. Now, when we talk about as preachers, when we talk about stories in the Bible, I, I don't want you to think for a moment we're talking about once upon a time. We believe that every story in the Bible is 100% true and accurate, that it is the inspired Word of God, that God has preserved it down through the generations that we might hear these wondrous stories of God and His love towards us. And so this morning, we're going to look at, first of all, a story that reveals, and we'll see what it does reveal in the first 10 verses of Acts chapter 3. The Bible says, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple of the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. In our text today, as we look at a few scriptures, you might be wise to take a pen and underline the name. And how many times we find in the Word of God that there's power in the name of Jesus. That it's the name of Jesus that can change your life. It's, it's not the name of Buddha or the name of Muhammad or some other religious leader. But friends, every Bible preacher ought to point you to Jesus Christ for he alone can save. The Bible says here in verse 6, Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up a walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up and immediately his feet and his ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. I, I, I couldn't help but admit, just let me share something. As I'm reading that, I'm picturing in my mind Cadence and Timmy walking with their moms. How many of you can see that with me today? You see those guys? Cadence never has her feet touch the floor. She's bouncing and jumping and running and holding on. And Timmy's the same way. He's dancing and he's all over the hallway. And I, I see this man leaping and praising God. He's walking with Peter and John, but he's not walking. You, you follow me? He's excited about what God has just done in his life. And his Bible says he's walking and leaping and praying. Oh, no, in the house of God? Don't, don't tell me he's praising God. Don't tell me he's leaping. Don't tell me he's enjoying the presence of God and his working in his life. Why well, couldn't be a Baptist? Couldn't be a Baptist. We, we need some of us to get our ankle bones to receive strength. We need a touch of God in our lives. That we'll leap and praise God unashamedly. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. He didn't hide it in a corner. Everybody saw him. Verse 10, and they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder. Oh, they couldn't have been Baptists either because they didn't criticize those that were praising God. Instead, they were filled with wonder, and they rejoiced with the man that now could walk. The Bible says they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. Let's pray. Father, help us. Father, we live in this day where we praise God and others mock, often the children of God. Father, we, it, it ought not be so. And God, you just pricked my heart in chapter 1 in these 10 verses, not really what the message is about, but to see 
this newborn babe in Christ, this one who just received a touch from God to leap and to praise and rejoice and others to be filled with wonder and amazement. Father, that's the first century church. What about today? God help us. Father, I pray that you'd help me today. Fill me with thy spirit and I pray that you'd speak, that you would move, that you'd do a work in our hearts, that you'd revive us. And Father, we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Lord, I surrender to you. I need you. I need your power. And Lord, there's many others here today who need a touch from you. They need your power. They need to see Jesus. So I pray that you'd reach down and help us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I've shared with you the story of the lame man that was laid at the gate called Beautiful, and it's likely that he was laid there by others as he was impotent or had no power of his own couldn't walk and the bible tells us later on that the man was above 40 years old i don't know why that is significant other than that he's been in this condition for a long long time he'd suffered his entire life and so the priests and the sadducees and the temple guards as they were rebuking peter john in chapter 4 they they showed a little compassion because the man had suffered long they didn't know what to do about the situation So they rebuked them from speaking and teaching in the name of Jesus, but Peter boldly said, what else could I speak about? This lame man stands before you. This one who was once impotent is now whole, and it's all because of the matchless name of Jesus. Who else could I speak about? The Bible says they threatened him a little more, and off they went. The story is all back here in chapter 3 in the first 10 verses. And there's some things that are revealed to us through the story. And I I want you to notice, first of all, and I I think this is important for us to get, and it might not uh, gel with the rest of the message as far as as what our point is today, but I think as we look at this in an expository way, it's important not to skip over things. And so I want you to notice the first thing it reveals. It reveals to us the, the plan for his disciples. You'll notice with me, the Bible says that a certain man in verse 2 was lame from his mother's womb, was carried. They placed him there, and whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. Now look what the verse says in verse 4. This is very important today. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him, with John said, look on us. How many of you here today have taken a trip to Israel? Anybody been to Israel? I I suppose that what Peter and John saw was commonplace to them. But I I enjoyed so much going to Israel. I enjoyed going to the empty tomb. I went in the empty tomb. And as I stood there, you were supposed to cycle in and look around, take a picture or two, and then cycle back out. There's hundreds of people coming in a line. And I kind of got in a corner and I stayed there. And I thought, the tour guide's going to throw me out. I'm just going to wait until they ask me to leave. Because I thought, what if I don't get back here? This is, this is the place where one of the greatest miracles in history took place, right here. I wanted to soak that in. I remember standing and staring at Golgotha. What, what, a, what a sight. One of the things we got to do is when we got to Jerusalem and we got in our motels, I said to my wife, I said, let's get out of here. He says, where are we going? I said, I don't know. I said, we're heading to the old city. And so we walked. It was about a 20-minute walk, and we went through the gates of the old city and saw the history of that place. And we walked all through the Muslim quarter that night. Just, just to think that this is where Jesus walked. The steps on the eastern side of the city are still there from the first century that Jesus would have been taken up into the temple. The gate is bricked in and you can't walk through it anymore, but you can stand. You know, the Bible says that Jesus will bust that wall wide open one day as he comes through that eastern gate and rides into his temple. But I, I, I remember getting on that Temple Mount, and of course the temple is gone now, and it's the Dome of the Rock. It's a Muslim construction there. But there's a marker 
And you can walk behind the Dome of the Rock and out on that plateau there on that Temple Mount, there's a marker and it says right here from the temple constructions where the Holy of Holies would have been. Where God came down and met with man. I just stand in awe when we get in those places and you, the history and the, the thoughts. That I, I remember what was particularly striking for me was Caiaphas' house. And they said, was it really Caiaphas' house? And when, you go to, when you go to Israel, there are traditional sites where they've put up a Roman Catholic church and they say this is the traditional site, but the tour guide himself will tell you it's probably not really here. This is just the, what the Catholics say. But then there are other sites they're pretty sure. Caiaphas' house, they found pottery in the house that, that had the name of Caiaphas right on it. They know it was his house. And down in the basement of that house that they've excavated, there's a dungeon cell where Jesus would have been held overnight. We got in there and as a group we sang a song and it echoed in that cave. To think that our Savior was laid there all night after receiving beatings. His back ripped and bloody and cold against those stone walls. I stood in awe and I wonder, as Peter and John are coming to the temple, did they have that same kind of reverence? Think about it with me, if you will, this morning. The temple now meant something different to them. This was not the same place that it was just, just a, a few years earlier before Jesus had come into their life. It was a place of worship and it was a place where the priests would sacrifice. But now they understood that Jesus was the Lamb of God that took away the sins of the world. And that, that temple, that house of God was something very different to them now. The Bible says they were going up at the hour of prayer to worship. And I would guess that they stood in awe at this place. But as they stood in awe, the Bible says they noticed somebody. A man that had his hand stretched out and was asking for alms. And what the Bible says next is very telling about the change in these men's lives. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, look on us. I look back at my Bible. I came here this morning, I guess about quarter to seven, and I was... Looking back, and I was thinking, what about this Peter? This was the same Peter that when blind Bartimaeus was crying out, Jesus of Nazareth, have mercy on me, he was saying, shh, don't trouble the master. This was the same Jesus, or the same Peter, that when the Bible says the parents were bringing their children to Jesus, he was rebuking them, saying, don't you come to Jesus. And Jesus said that famous thing, suffer the little children to come unto me for such is the kingdom of God. This was the same Peter that said to Jesus, let's send the people away to the cities and villages that they might buy bread. Let's get rid of these people. This was the same Peter that tried to cast out demons from a little boy and he couldn't. He had no power. But now here was Peter that said, don't send them away. Fasten your eyes upon me. Look upon me. Do you see the change in his life? You say, you say what is the difference? There's a passage in the Bible in Matthew chapter 16 where the Lord Jesus Christ, we have that famous phrase where he says to, to the disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Just a couple verses later, Jesus says, I, the Son of Man, must go to Jerusalem to be betrayed in the hands of sinners. And Peter says, Not so, Lord. And Jesus said, Get thee behind me, Satan. For thou savorest not the things that be of God. But then he said to Peter this, When thou art converted. Wait a minute. Here, here's a man that had already done great works in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He had gone out with disciples and preached the word of God. As a matter of fact, when he said, I believe thou art the Christ, the Son, the living God, he had just returned from a mission trip where he said, even the devils are subject to thy name. He'd been preaching and healing and helping. And Jesus said, there's still some things you need to be converted of. I want to suggest that 
from the time of Calvary when G- Peter denied the Lord Jesus Christ and met him on that seashore. And Jesus said, Peter, feed my sheep. Now Peter was converted. And look at his attitude towards other people. Before It was hushing blind Bartimaeus. And before, it was rebuking the parents of these small children. And before, he wondered why Jesus would speak to the Samaritan woman. And before, he was telling the multitudes to go away and find food. But now, Peter loved people. Folks, that is the hallmark of Christianity. The hallmark of Christianity that we love the brethren. That we show love for one another. And friends, if there's an area in our lives that you say, God, give me revival, may it be this area that God would revive our love for the brethren and our love for the lost and our love for a, a world that needs Jesus Christ. Would God revive us? And so we see, first of all, it revealed, this story reveals the plan for his disciples. And by the way, we're all to be his disciples. But it revealed, secondly, Not only the plan for his disciples, it revealed the power in his name. Look at the Bible says in verse 6, as we continue on, it says, And Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. The Lord Jesus Christ, his name has power to heal those that are infirm and impotent and and need a touch from God. But friends, he has the power to save your life. The Bible says in verse 16 of chapter 3, and his name through faith in his name hath made this man strong whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Look in Acts chapter 4. The Bible says, In verse 10, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at the knot of the builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There is power in the name of Jesus. Listen, I don't know what your hope of salvation lies in today, but if it is not in Jesus Christ, you cannot be a child of God. The Bible says this in John chapter 1 and verse 12, but as many as received him, Jesus Christ, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Jesus Christ himself said to his disciples in John chapter 14 verse 6, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And if I go... I I will come again and receive you unto myself. And so we have the promise, and Thomas says, and he says, and the way ye know, and Thomas says, how do we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh the Father but by me. Friends, the question is just as simple. Do you know Jesus? Have you trusted in his name? Oh, there's a lot of other theories out there and religious conspiracies that will say this is the way to go to heaven but Jesus is the only way and by the way it's Jesus plus nothing it's faith in his name alone it doesn't say you have to trust Jesus Christ and go to church although I think it's important to go to church I think going to church is a matter of obedience I think it's a matter of personal spiritual growth. And so we go to church because we, we want to worship the Lord corporately and we want to learn more about Jesus Christ from his word. But going to church doesn't save you. Nowhere in the Bible will you find that. Being baptized won't save you. Baptism is a matter of obedience. The Bible says that by grace, which is a gift, are ye saved through faith. Oh, the criminal on the cross was never baptized. And yet Jesus said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. With a wonderful promise from God, listen, it's Jesus plus nothing. We just must come to him and trust in the power of his name. So it's a story that reveals, it reveals the plan for his disciples, that's you and me, but it reveals the power in his name. But I want you to notice, secondly, in, in verses 11 through 18, we see a sin that repeats. See if this sounds familiar to you. Verse 11, and as the lame man which was healed 
held Peter and John. Boy, if, if somebody did that for you, you wouldn't want to let them go. All the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us? As though by our own power or holiness, we had this man, we had made this man to walk. The God of Abraham and Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof ye are witnesses. And his name through faith in his name hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And I want you to notice the sin that repeats. First of all, we see a common misunderstanding. First of all, in verse 12, they misunderstood God's power. Peter asked them, why marvel ye at this? I titled this section, A Sin That Repeats, because I see it repeated among the brethren today. We're surprised when God does something great. Do you know that if God stopped his miracle working power he would have to cease to be god because that's just who he is he is omnipotent he is almighty all powerful if god ceased to work in the lives of men and touch and heal and rearrange lives and save people from that miry clay friends he'd cease being god but he is from everlasting to everlasting he is almighty we can trust in him and the people that misunderstood his power. And Peter says, why are you marveling at this? this? This isn't really all that amazing. This is something God does every single day. When I was walking with Jesus for those three and a half years, this is what I saw all the time. Oh, but you've rejected him. The holy one and the just one. And you've crucified him. And you've desired a murderer, Barabbas, to be granted unto you. Oh. You missed out, didn't you? Friends, do we take for granted God's power? You know, often I I know I've used this illustration before, but I've often heard people pray in the auditorium, then in the hallway say, Oh, I guess they're in trouble. Hmm. I think they're done for. Isn't that too bad? And oh, it is sad. But where's our faith in God? Story is told about a drought ridden community. And it got so bad, the farmers were going to lose all that they had. And so the local pastor put up a sign and said, We're praying for rain tomorrow morning. Come and join us and pray for rain. And many came from the community. It was so dry, they couldn't work anyway. Their crops were dying. There was nothing they could do. And many came and thought they would join in prayer. And the pastor got up and said, How many of you come to pray for rain? And they all raised their hand. And he said, Who brought an umbrella? Where is our faith? Where is our faith? Is it in Peter? There's a whole religious denomination out there. That's where their faith is. They pray to Mary and they pray to Peter and they pray to the saints. And friends, Peter himself said, Oh, I marvel you this, at this. This is a common misunderstanding. They misunderstood God's power, but I want you to notice, secondly, they misplaced God's praise. Look what it says in the next part. Why marvel ye at this? Now look, or, so this is a different thought. Why look ye so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness we made this man to walk? This wasn't us. Peter's saying, don't you worship me. The Bible doesn't say they said anything but they wondered and they were amazed. They didn't cry out. They weren't bowing down maybe to Peter. But as they gathered around to see what was going on, Peter saw that look in their eye and he thought, "Uh uh-oh, uh-oh. Can I tell you that gets a lot of preachers in trouble today? I'm going to heal the, I'm going to give you the blessing. Wham! And a whole section of people falls over. Have you seen that on TV? Crazy stuff. I don't you fall for it. That same preacher walks out. Every time he walks out on the platform, he doesn't come out on the platform until the choir is singing, How Great Thou Art. I don't think he believes it's about God. 
We can get in trouble when people look at us like that. Peter's saying, listen, this wasn't me. He said, why are you telling me this, preacher? Because you need to know this isn't anybody but God that can work in your life. You know, I, I appreciate when somebody will call and say, preacher, would you, would you pray for me? I, yeah, I'm, what, what a privilege to be trusted with a prayer request. And if, the Bible says we're to bear one another's burdens and we're to pray for one another fervently and we're to love the brother and we're to help each other in that way. I get that. And that's, that's wonderful, important. But friends, listen, uh, there's nobody here that has any special power. Nobody has any special power except for the person that has tapped into the most high. The one that has more prayer power, more prayer time, and will entertain your name before the throne of the most high. That's where we go is to Jesus. And so it's a sin that repeats because we see it still today. They misunderstood God's power and they misplaced God's prayer, but I want you to see not just a common misunderstanding, but a common mistake The Bible says in verse 13, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus. But here's the problem. They couldn't see Jesus. He was gone. He had died on a cross and many of them had heard some rumor that he had risen from the grave, perhaps. Others believed the lie that his grave had been robbed. But now Jesus had ascended. And here's the common mistake It's a whole lot easier to put your faith in that man over there that reached down and took the blame man by the hand and picked him up than it is to put your faith and trust in something you can't see. So Peter wisely says, wait, 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 wait. It's not me. Let me tell you who it is. It's Jesus. The one who you betrayed, the the just one, the holy one, the righteous one, this one that has been caught up. Peter just explains the Savior. They heard Peter speak to the man and they saw Peter take him by the hand and they saw the man leaping and praising God and they watched them enter the temple together so they concluded that Peter must have wrought a great miracle. And Peter knew it. He says, no, 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 no. Listen, our faith must be by faith and not by sight. We put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ and him alone. Do you know why so many religions teach works today? Because they can see them. I can do something about my salvation. I can do good works. I can give to charity. I can be baptized. And 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 those are all good things. Those are all things of obedience. And we ought to be baptized as a profession of our faith in Christ after we've been saved. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2, then they that gladly received his word, those that were already saved by faith and accepted Jesus Christ, then they were baptized, not as a part of their salvation. But then the Bible says they continued steadfastly in the apostles' apostles doctrine. So they they went to church and they learned the word of God and they were taught and discipled. And boy, those are all wonderful things, but they don't save you. They grow you and they keep you in obedience unto God. But we have to have our faith in Jesus Christ alone. Friend, let me ask you today, do you know Jesus? Jesus. What are you trusting in? If you came here today because this building of brick and mortar and you say, well, if I go to a church, I I should be saved. I can see it. It's visible. No, no, no. You put your trust in Jesus. Don't you put your trust in the man behind the pulpit, anybody in the choir, your Sunday school teacher, anybody else. Peter wouldn't allow it. You have to trust in Jesus and in his wonderful name. Then we see thirdly this morning, a Savior that revives We talked about a story that reveals and a sin that repeats, but I want you to see the Savior that revives. And look, if you will, in verse 19. Repent ye therefore. What are we repenting of? Repent ye therefore and be converted. Understand something this morning. Repentance means to turn away from one thing and to turn to another. The Bible says that when Wickedness filled the earth. It repented the Lord that he created man. That doesn't mean that God was admitting that he was wrong. God is never wrong. It just simply means that this was what I was doing, and now here's what I am doing. I'm going to pronounce judgment. I'm changing direction here. And so when we repent in the Bible, he's saying, listen, 
Peter's saying, listen, no, no, no. Repent, repent. Don't you trust in me. You trust in him. Don't you trust in works. You trust in him. Don't you trust in your baptism. You trust in him. Don't you trust in religion. You trust in him. Don't trust in the church. You trust in him. Repent. Peter could see what was unraveling before him. God was doing a great work and people were looking at Peter. Peter said, no, 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 no. you got to repent of that. You can't trust in anything but Jesus. So he says, repent and be converted. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come. You know what that word refreshing means? It means a recovery of breath Revival. Now look what happens. You can be trusting in a whole lot of things. You can be religious today, friend. And you can be trusting in a whole lot of things, but he says repent and be converted. And what happens when you do that? That your sins may be blotted out. Christ will forgive you when you trust him. When the times of refreshing shall come, revival, he'll breathe life into that body that was once deadened by sin and now made alive in Christ Jesus. And you hath he quickened who were dead. That's refreshing. That's revival. Friends, the revival that you need today is a touch from God. I don't know how it'll play out if you're not a child of God today and you will repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. At that very moment, the time of refreshing will come and Jesus will come and the Holy Spirit will breathe life into your deadened soul and he will save you today. If you're already a child of God, God wants to touch your life and do a work in your life today, but you must be touched by him. Boy, there's some here today whose ankles could receive strength and we could be revived and we could be leaping and praising God again if God would just touch us. He's a savior that revives. And look at the, we see repentance refreshing, but look at the realization in verse 20. This refreshing, by the way, doesn't come from anything in verse 19, but what? The presence of God of the Lord. No church can do it. No religion can do it. No baptism, no good works, no whatever. Listen, I'll say it a thousand times today. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Look at verse 20. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. What is Peter saying to these people finally this morning? Repent. Don't don't look to me. There's a multitude of people there in that temple. And they were there to sacrifice, and they were there because it was the hour of prayer, and they were there to worship. And when they saw that lame man walk in the gate with Peter and John, leaping and praising God, instantly their eyes were turned. And they looked at Peter, and if I, if I can say this, I think they looked at him like he was maybe the Messiah that they were looking for. They'd already rejected Jesus. And they thought, maybe, maybe he's the one. Is he the one sent from God? And Peter saw the look in their eyes. He says, no, no, here's what you need to do. The real power is Jesus. How was this man healed? By the name of Jesus. This man stands before you because of faith in the name of Jesus. And how, uh, here's what you need to do now. You can know that, Jesus, but first you need to repent. Repent and be converted. And Christ will blot away all your sins. When the time of refreshing comes, revival, he'll breathe life into you. And then you'll have Jesus in verse 20. He'll be a part of your life and you'll have a relationship with him. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes this morning. We're out of time, but in Acts chapter 4, we see that the Peter and John are brought before the religious leaders, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees. They were grieved that he taught through Jesus the resurrection of the dead. It was in that little statement that Peter made in verse 15, you killed the prince of life whom God hath raised from the dead, and that caught their attention and they were bothered. But they couldn't deny the work of God. But you see a revival in that church too. 
The Bible says that Peter and John returned to the church and they told them all that had happened, that that they had been rebuked for preaching and teaching in the name of Jesus, but they boldly stood before them and and said, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And they said, we can only preach Jesus, that's all we know. It says, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they noticed that they were unlearned and ignorant men, but they'd been in the presence of Jesus. They'd been touched and changed. They couldn't deny it. They went back with a wonderful report to their church, and the Bible says, after they gave the report, it says, and when they had prayed, the place was shaken. People were getting saved, and lives were being changed, and what a great love in the church. The end of the chapter says they all men had all things common, and they just laid their things at the apostles' feet, and they took care of the needs of one another. They loved one another. That was a revival broke out in that church. But it all started because a man unashamedly said, no, no, not me, but Jesus. Only Jesus. Only Jesus. Let's stand to our feet this morning with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Maybe there's one here today that doesn't know Christ as Savior. We'd like to help you. Such good news to know today that Jesus Christ will save you if you'll just trust in Him. It's one that would say, Pastor, I'm not sure I'm saved. If I were to die today, I, I've trusted in a lot of things, but I'm not sure I've trusted in Jesus. I've trusted in Jesus plus a lot of things. No, no, repent and trust Jesus alone. Turn away from all other things and just put your faith in Him. I know it's easier to trust in things you can see and things you see happening, but you have to believe this one by faith. Come to Him and believe. The instruments are going to begin to play. If God has spoke to your heart, this altar is open even now. But if there's one, say, Pastor, I'm not sure I'm saved. Would you help me today? Would you come and we'll take a Bible and show you what it means to have eternal life? Would you step out even now? Maybe there's somebody else say, I need that touch from God. I need to be revived like that, revived in love and revived in uh, a, a care for the lost and revived in some other way. But I just need that touch from God. Why don't you come and ask God for it? Ask God to shake your life and stir your life. Would you come? Have thine own way. Have thine own way. Surrender to him today. Sing together. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. You may be seated for a moment for a couple of announcements. If your children are over in the gym or wherever they are, give them just a few minutes. We hope that you can stay. If you want to have a hot dog with them, that'd be fine. But we appreciate you allowing them to be here today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pastor Fury. I don't know where I found the time, but I had a hot dog over there with the, with the kids. I went in there, and the place, the place is just packed. And those bouncy castles are huge. I don't think the seniors could handle it. That was a slip of the lip by me to gymnastics. Like, <laughs> uh, you know, I prayed and I said, Lord, sometimes I'm so proud, so contentious, so argumentative. Speak to my heart this morning, Lord. I just nailed down, nailed down at the altar and man, God came along so quick. Just broke my heart. And uh, these, these kids over there, I was late getting to 
uh, junior church because I didn't want to leave the platform. And so I only had maybe five or six minutes to preach. But uh, Ruth had already started a lesson, so the kids were prepared. And I, I don't know how many, there was a, a number of children that put up their hand for salvation. Amen. And some of them got saved. I don't know how many. But I know there was at least two that I heard of already that trusted Christ as their Savior. Praise the Lord. That's what this is all about. If you get a chance to go over there and see how much fun those kids are, you might even get involved in it. And get in. The... Brother Cody said, I'd like to get a picture of you, Paul, up in the Bouncy Castle. <laughs> Maybe I will. Um, just a few announcements. There's a missionary banquet, uh, February 10th at 6 p.m. There will be four locations. They're all listed there. Uh, go to the one that's uh, closest for you, and please choose the location. Uh, this will be potluck, so if you have any questions about what to take, please ask your host and hostess. They're all listed there, and there's a sign-up sheet there in the foyer. We need you to sign up because it's just two weeks away. Uh, please sign up wherever you'd like to go. There's four sheets there in the, in the foyer. The missions trip, uh, Caesar uh, Mejia is planning a missions trip to Peru this summer. The dates will be August 3rd to 13th. There will be many exciting things happening in Peru. Uh, please pray uh, to see if the Lord will give you the opportunity to join Caesar. And if you have that burden on your heart for missions uh, and you can make it, please do. Go with Caesar and uh, see it. Maybe you've never been on a missions trip. It would be a wonderful thing for you to do. And then there's a thank you. The BBA is sending out a great big thank you for your support in last week's spaghetti dinner. Uh, with your help and generosity, $867.90 was raised. We really appreciate your support. Thank you uh, to Miss, uh, Mrs. Norris for heading up the fundraisers and for Mrs. Judy Judge and Natasha Logan for help as well. Thank you, preaching. I just, I just was talking to Matt Forth in the hallway. Um, Dwayne's father passed away yesterday, and so I know you folks have been praying for him, so we thought we'd let you know right away. So continue to pray. Uh, Dwayne and Bonnie are headed down to Pennsylvania right now to be with uh, his dad's widow. So would you be in prayer for that in the, in the funeral service? Okay, thanks, preacher. And there's one other announcement. Teens, uh, February 1st to the 3rd winter camp. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Lord, we uh, do pray for uh, Bonnie and Dwayne, Lord, Forth, and passing of his dad, Lord. And pray. I pray, Lord, you comfort their hearts. It's a hard thing to know. And we pray, Lord, that you would uh, bless each one here about in your presence. Help us to have a good day serving you. Help us to serve you with joy and gladness for the abundance of all things. Thank you for the many children that were out here today, Lord. What a great day to see your hand moving, Lord Jesus. All the glory belongs to you, Lord. To God be the glory. Great things he hath done, great things you are doing, and great things you will do. Dismiss us with your blessing, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You are dismissed.